Le Cordon Bleu College of Culinary Arts is dedicated to preparing aspiring professionals in the areas of culinary arts, patisserie and baking, and hospitality and restaurant management. Disaster Planning and Response Art Rescue is a first responder for the world of art, providing planning, packing, evacuation, conservation, and storage for all your treasured possessions. Paperweights are the crown jewels of glass artistry. You can discover both antique and modern paperweights at the L.H. Selman Gallery in Chicago's Fine Arts Building. Welcome back to the main stage. My name is Elizabeth Alfano, and of course, we are at Fear No Art Presents the Dinner Party. Great to have you here at the main stage in Chicago. It's been an exciting month in Chicago since I saw you last. So Chicago has turned 175. Looks pretty good. Looks pretty good for 175. We're very honored and thrilled the Chicago Department of Cultural Affairs and Special Events has asked us to partner with them as they kick off. So they'll be celebrating March through August, a bunch of different events to celebrate our big big lovely fat birthday. So if you'd like to go to more events just like this that are celebrating the city of Chicago's birthday, you can go to explorechicago.org forward slash 175 days. Lots of good things going on in the city. But I think the really big news for us, which is just so very exciting, Fear No Art Presents the Dinner Party has been picked up by TiVo. So that's a big deal. It's such a big deal. They only take, uh, as you know, this is a live broadcast. It's a five camera feed going live on the internet. And they only take web shows that are of TV quality. So they take very, very few. So if you have TiVo, how many of you have TiVo? Of course you do. Of course you do, because it's great. Yeah, lots of great TiVo. So um, if you go to TiVo and you go to TV shows, then web shows, you'll find us in the food and drink section. So it's very exciting. So hopefully you know how this works. So I invite three creatives to dinner. And a celebrity chef, a guest chef, makes something wonderful for us. And over food and wine and a few impromptu performances, we've got some good ones tonight, we uh, let the conversations flow and it goes all over the map. So we have a really fun night tonight. If you're watching on fearnoart.tv or, of course, if you are here in the stage, hopefully you have your Twitter fingers ready. There are lots of great prizes that we're going to be giving away for tweets that we pick to be asked on stage. So uh, does everyone have the Act One Pub code? It should be on that little piece of paper. Does everyone have your code so you can have access to the Act One Pub? Yeah. I'll take that as a yes. <laughs> I'll take that as a yes that you do. Uh, and our handle, of course, is Fear No Art CHGO. So uh, don't miss out. You're going to want to Twitter in. Right before we announce our fantastic guests, I also have to announce our fantastic sponsors. So I'm thrilled to work with DPR Art Rescue, which is comprised of the best art shipper in the land, Terry Dowd, the best furniture conservator, Stan Bernacki, and the best painting conservator, Parma Conservation. So it's a thrill to work with them. Of course, Le Cordon Bleu, who could ask for a better uh, school to be associated with for cooking. And then the L.H. Selman Gallery of Fine Glass Paperweights. Sometimes after the show, people come up and they take a peek at the table because the paperweights are just so gorgeous. So feel free to do that. It's wonderful to have them. But we have small, smaller sponsors who also help us in many ways. Vac Inc. Again, I told you this is a five camera live feed, so we have technical issues that come up all the time. And Vac Inc. handles those for us. They're wonderful. Also, the Chicago, um, Chicago Gallery News is fantastic. Three Arts Organization and the Richard H. Driehaus Foundation that just gave us a grant. We love them. Yes, we, I, yes God, I absolutely love them. Um, and of course, uh, the wonderful design team of Ken and Frank, who searched high and low to find me this gorgeous table from Design Fournier, just a lovely set. So it's, it's thrilling to work with them. But probably the most important person that we now work with uh, for you guys is Vos Chocolate. So tonight, not only are you getting wonderful food from Three Aces, you're getting Vos Chocolate. So you can hold on to your bootstraps for that. And you also should have pink cards that, um, I see some of you are using them as coasters. They are, uh, they're, they're 
they're not coasters. They are a uh, uh, gift certificate for a free truffle at any Vosges location. So you want to hold on to your free truffle. Yes, hold on to that. All right, everybody, I have just wonderful guests, and I'm so honored to have them here. My first guest is truly a force to be reckoned with. He's an author. He's a poet. He's the co-founder of Chicago Slam Works, and he is the founder of the Poetry Slam, Mark Smith. Thank you for coming. Thank you for coming. Sit right over there, please. Okay. Mark's going to sit, sit right over, over there. there. All right. My next guest, elegant and eloquent, formerly the associate curator at the Studio Museum in Harlem. She's now the curator at the MCA, Naomi Beckwith. Thank you for coming. I really appreciate it. Thank you for coming. So you're right there. So the last person, this is truly such a thrill for me. He has his own band, the Sons of Blues. He's also in something called Chicago Blues, a living legend. He has played with Coco Taylor, Muddy Waters, Junior Wells. For me, he is the real deal. It is often said of him that he is the blues. We have Billy Branch here. Come on. Oh, thank you for coming. Thank you for coming. Right, thank you. <laughs> I really appreciate it. You sit there. Thank you. OK, so working hard in the kitchen, we have the fantastic chef Matt Troost from Three Aces. And he's going to be out with us in just a second. But I'm going to join my guests. Everybody, thank you for coming. Well, thanks, thanks for having us. us. So uh, now, you, you've been chatting here on the side. But before tonight, you didn't know each other. None of no. Us no. Okay. No. Well, you actually have a really strong connection together, and what I'd like to do is bring three artists who don't know each other, completely different domains, or people who work in the arts, completely different domains, but they actually have a strong connection. So we're going to talk about that in just a bit. But it's hard to focus on that conversation when we know that we have food coming our way. So <laughs> let's hear from Chef Matt Troost and see what he's got for our appetizers. Hi, uh, I'm Matt. I am the chef at Three Aces. Tonight, we're going to start off with a little gnocchi appetizer. So first thing that we're going to do is make our gnocchi dough. And to do that, we are going to take some ricotta cheese, um, farm eggs. We're going to take some Parmesan cheese and some flour. We're going to mix them all together and make the dough. So we'll just do this real quick. I like to do this with my hands because it just you get a better feel for the dough um, as opposed to just constantly mixing it with a spoon. You know, this way you get everything incorporated without over mixing it. So we're going to take this dough and we're going to put it in the refrigerator and we're going to let it sit for about <clears throat> at the bare minimum 30 minutes and then we're going to come back to it and we are going to roll out some gnocchi. Uh, now that the dough is rested, we're going to roll them into little balls and then we're going to actually make proper gnocchi. This is our gnocchi paddle. This is what provides the ridges. And then we get a gnocchi. We are going to now put together your gnocchi appetizer. Um, first thing we're going to do is we're going to get our pan nice and hot. <clears throat> and we have water boiling for the gnocchi already. Um, once the pan gets hot, we're going to throw our butter in there and let it brown up a little bit. Hit it with a little sage and a little bit of balsamic vinegar to make a uh, brown butter balsamic vinegar sauce. Get our sage in there and let that fry up a little bit. It goes against all of your uh, natural instincts to shake the pan, but you can't shake the pan just yet. You get a better sauce out of it this way. So we have that going. We're going to throw our gnocchi in. It will not take long to cook. So our sauce is warm. What we're going to do is we're going to take a few of the beets. We're going to throw them in. All right, so we're going to go ahead and fish some of these guys out. We're going to right in your pan. All right, so now that we have our golden beets and gnocchi in there, we're going to take a little bit of uh, fresh baby wild arugula, sprinkle that in there, just give it a quick toss or two, and then 
We're just going to get it on a plate. And to finish it, we have some fresh pecorino cheese. We're just going to peel a little bit on there. And after that, we have a salt cured egg yolk. And we're going to just grate a little bit on there. And that is your gnocchi dish. All right. Wasn't that good? Yes. <laughs> Absolutely. Dig in. Please start eating. Please start eating. So this I think everyone amazing. in the audience already had some, right? It was super good. And we, I think we have Matt. Matt, are you still around? To talk to us. Oh, good. Hello. So this is Matt. How about it? All right. So this is going to give the artist a chance to eat and nibble while I talk to Matt for just a little bit. So Matt, what amazes me is how the simplest ingredients can make just the most wonderful food. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> He's a conversationalist. I know. Well, I, not um, so much. So what, what would, like I would never think to put golden beets with basically a form of pasta. Uh, yeah, it's, it's one of those things where it's, if, if you don't think of it as a beet and you just think of it as a component, like it's sweet. Um, to uh -huh. kind of just balance out the acidity of the dish. Uh -huh. If you just think about it like that, it, it makes a little bit more sense. Yes, yes. Well, um, every time I hang out at Three Aces, and I do, who's been to Three Aces? <laughs> Fantastic, right? And I do, I hang out at Three Aces a lot, particularly in the summer. I've spent some really good nights on that patio. Um, I'm always amazed at the diversity of the menu and how fresh everything is. So I really thank you for that. You're welcome. Um, I know you've got a lot going on in the kitchen, and you're going to come back and talk to us in a little bit for our entrees. But um, thank you so much for this. You're welcome. Enjoy. Are you guys enjoying? Thank oh, you, Matt. Some more yeah, <laughs> so um, feel free to keep eating and nibbling. Mm. I'm glad that you are. Um, <laughs> so the connection that you guys have together, the reason I wanted to get you at this dinner party is because in the wildly different fields in which you play, you, you're all actually ad hoc arts educators. And as we know, we're losing our arts funding left and right, right? So that's something that keeps dwindling. And you are all die hard in making sure that this doesn't happen. Keep eating. <laughs> Mark with Chicago Slam Works, they go into schools and they bring poetry into the schools and they use it as a teaching tool. And we'll talk to you about that in a second. Naomi has a, a, a different twist. You know, as a curator, she's an extension of the MCA. And the MCA, as you all know, I mean, is one of the great institutions that we have in the city of Chicago. And something I just learned, there are only three museums, correct me if I'm wrong, three museums in the United States, the MCA being one of them, that has lecture series as well as performances, as well as um, music and theater. So they really try to bring people in and reach them in any way they can. And as an extension, a curator is always trying to reach people. So it's not pro proper education per se, but you're also reaching out. And then Billy, I thought I would probably start with you. You have something called Blues in the Schools. Right. And you've been doing that for a really long time where you go into the schools and you make sure that people have an understanding for the blues. Could you tell me more about that program and how it started? Well, um, I'm gonna eat I've that. been doing that since 1978. Oh, God. And uh, <laughs> thank you. And it, uh, I, I began with a um, residency through the Illinois Arts Council. Mm. Uh, from that, I went to Urban Gateways. The Arts Council, for example, the very first school was Newberry Elementary School. And I still hear from my former students oh, from do. that first residency. Uh, in that case, um, all the children, all the students learn blues harmonica. Mm -hmm. uh, they learn oral history, they learn standard blues songs, and they compose their own original songs, and it culminates in performances. Wow. Um, I've done this program all over the world now, uh, Japan, Canada, Belgium. Um, sometimes they're comprehensive enough to allow my whole band to travel wow. to a different location for a period up to five or six weeks. In which case, the students learn the different instruments, piano, uh, bass, guitar, drums. They all learn harmonica. Yes. And, depend, you know, it's, it's a matter of, of 
of course, it all boils down to the money. Yeah. But uh, depending on the budget, uh, we've done five and six re week residencies, and the children sometimes perform for two weeks from school to school or in, yeah. in festival settings. Yeah. Or in, uh, even in nightclubs. And um, it's extensive, so they're writing as well, which is what's amazing. They're to writing me. as well. What do you see that the students get from well, this? Well, over the years, I have uh, received uh, material songs that I actually were so deep that I could record it. Uh, you could I mean, or you could not? Th no, that I could. That I could. I mean, from the 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 lighthearted, frivolous, or you know, I didn't do my homework today, can't go out and play. <laughs> Yeah. Hey man, or that's serious. Two songs about the the Iraq and the Mideast war, yeah. about gangs, about rape. Uh, really deep. It it just depends, and and it's uh, been quite a quite an experience. I mean, to see the depth that comes out of some of these young souls. Yeah. And I've worked from you know from kindergarten to high school to college age. What I always find about music, I don't know for any other one, anyone else in the audience, but you know, I've had a little piano, I'm, I'm certainly not very good, but whenever I get myself back into the habit of practicing piano, my concentration as a whole is much better, I read much better, mm -hmm. I, I just, I'm more astute. Music makes me smarter, for mm -hmm. lack of a better expression. Mm -hmm. Well, it's, it's got so many other aspects, you know, mathematics, of course, is closely, you know, and so many creative thinking, it does, so many things. Yes. To, uh, yeah. Yes. Well, okay. So you also have Chicago Slam Works, and that brings poetry into the schools. Right. It's you know it's kind of the same situation. You go into schools. Uh, I never thought I'd be a you know I hated school so much. I wasn't <laughs> going to go back in school. I actually but, don't uh, see you as a student. <laughs> it's true. Yeah, yeah. You know, but you it's it kind of same kind of model. You go. It's it. It's not enough just to go there and teach them skills. You got to give them some place to go with it. So when he, when Billy talked about the performances they get to do after it, it's that's a solid goal, and and mm -hmm. that makes it spark. And that's for the slammers. All the slammers across the world have have gone into the schools, and it's the same thing. And because we can create this event at the end of these workshops. Something uh, to work towards. Like the great thing in Chicago, in Chicago the uh, young Chicago's author is louder than a bomb that everybody's yeah. uh, raving about. Mm -hmm. uh, that And Robbie Q, who's uh, the artistic or director or something, is in the audience. He is. There. Where uh, is he? There he is. Yeah, Robbie's wildly talented. Yeah. He's Robbie. And Robbie had something called the Encyclopedia Show, which has come out of, of the, slam. the Slam. All this, yeah, this, all this stuff is, is spun, spun out of the Slam because it's the Slam is such a. So I just have to stop you for a second. It, it is a populist thing. You bring poetry to the people. Does everybody know what he means when he says Slam? No. Wow! Tell no. them. Tell them. <laughs> where have you been? Yeah, where have you been? <laughs> tell them. Tell them what you mean by a poetry slam. The Poetry Slam started at the, at the Green Mill uh, 25 years ago. In fact, it's the longest running nightclub show in Chicago, 25 years, every Sunday night at the, at the Green Mill. And, and, and what it basically is, is that it's the remarriage of the art of performing with the art of writing poetry. We perform the work. We don't just blah, 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 blah. And it's become very exciting. And, and more than that, it's a type of show, a very, a very highly entertaining show, uh, interactive show, and open with music, with poetry, dance with poetry, art like uh, our artists did. We had one time somebody drawing while somebody's reading their poetry. It, it, it's the open house of uh, what you can do with good words. And it's spread around the world, and it's also inspired a lot of different, different shows of of other uh, disciplines. So, so uh, again, we're back to this concept of trying to reach people and bring them arts education, if you will, or just the arts, in whatever way that you can. And you've always been a big proponent of, you know, poetry for the people and making oh, it fun. Right, and and you know, the great thing is that about the show that I'm very proud of. It's everybody, you know, everybody from the bums off the street to the detectives mm -hmm. to the scientists from Fermi Lab can be at the show and. And more importantly, it's intergenerational. It's old guys like me with young kids, and it's uh, it's an important thing that you don't get a lot of places where there's 
uh, the cross generations. Mm -hmm. I, you know, I, you know, I've, everybody loves the blues if you're from Chicago, so you, <laughs> yeah, you get I'm new man. generations all the time. <laughs> Well, so all this talk about poetry, and since we've had some people who don't know what a poetry slam is, maybe you should get up and do something. What do you think? Oh, is that what the yeah, lady no, no. <laughs> Hey, I haven't, oh, got, I haven't even eaten yet. Uh, <laughs> okay. Okay. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Who's this we're guy? Pushing, we're pushing you out. Sing we for your supper. We can't, <laughs> we can't get you to perform fast enough. It ain't something you can purchase. You ain't going to find it at the merchandise mart. It ain't a brain thing. It can't be calculated. You can read about it in a book, but it ain't there. Maybe at one time you thought you saw it in the silver glaze of an old theatrical photograph framed in the family album, or heard it off a blue note label sounding a feathery sequence of moonlight serenade or sensed it in the clacking keys of a beat-up saxophone compelling you to listen. But by now, those things are once, twice, three times removed, pawned to some old man in a hock shop, cluttered up with all the things of value we traded in for a spell. To make ends meet, we said. But weren't we really saying that that's to be the end of it? that it's all to be left hanging on a hook, tarnished in a velvet case, mute behind a glass door, sleeping in a box, the end of it, inside of us, where it refrains every night when we can't drag ourselves up out of bed, every night when we can't keep our eyelids from dropping down like the hock shop roll-up shutter door, padlock at the bottom. Don't we hear the groaning ghost of it? and the machines we drive to work each day. In the etiquette and protocol of our office building pals. In the clocks. Don't we hear it in the clocks or see it in the faces? Millions of faces walking dull-eyed down Michigan, shopping on State Street, banking in Berwyn. Oh, it's there, all right. The groaning, cadaverous it is there, but the live flesh and blood it ain't. I'm tempted to climb off the stage, but I'll be out of your cameras probably. <laughs> if, will you? Good. Here we go. I hate being away from you. I'm with the people now. If somebody outside the Water Tower Plaza or under Picasso's dog took out that tarnished upside down question mark, licked the lead, read on just what had to be said, blew out to all those faces, hey, hey, listen to me, listen to me, listen to me. Ooh, wouldn't the most of us just sidestep a circle around that cat? <laughs> Maybe toss a few quarters at his case? Turn our heads straight forward, resume the march. Foot ahead of, I wonder if they can follow me over here. Foot against a head foot. Trying to distance ourselves from that music. Trying to keep it out of our hearts. Trying not to wonder, what was that ticket number? Where is that pawn shop door? Well, that's the problem. Here's the solution. If you need to kiss it, kiss it. If you need to kick it, kick it. If you need to scream it, scream it. If you need to scream it, scream it. But kiss it, kiss it, kiss it, kick it, scream it now. If you need to leave it, leave it. If you need to love it, love it. If you need to hold it, hold it. But leave it, love it, hold it now. If you need to squeeze it, squeeze it. If you need to spill it, spill it. If you need to tell the world you got more to you, then the world has as of yet allowed you to be and be it. Tell it, spill it, squeeze it out of each instantaneous moment. Make the juice, the jive, the jazz, the jism, the mysticism that ism you. Grab at the moon and hold the stars hot inside your head. Because now is all there ever was and all there ever will be. So kiss it. Kick it, scream it, now. <laughs> All right. 
Can I eat now? <laughs> 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 movement of 25 years. Uh, you have a tweet for you, sir, and that tweet is coming from Tell C. Tell that old guy to shut up. <laughs> <laughs> I don't want to listen to him. C. Thorin, you have just won yourself two tickets to the Chicago Slam Works Pass, which means... <laughs> Which means there's a performance on April 3rd, there's a performance on May 21st, there's a performance in July, and there's also the Encyclopedia show. So you get two tickets for all four shows. And the question is, how do you think slam poetry relates to other literary movements of our time? I think that this, the slam movement is, is probably going to go down as the biggest thing that happened in the a performance literary, uh, in the literary scene. For, of our century, bigger than the beats everyone. Everybody talks about the beats and everything. The beat thing was never as big as this is. This is all over the world. When the Speakeasy Ensemble and I went to Hamburg, Germany for the German National Slam, we performed, the, for the first four nights, we were performing in these old opera houses that are centuries old, beautiful. You know, 800 people each night. The last night is in a hockey stadium 5,000 people listening to slam poetry, performance poetry. And, and you'd think in a 5,000 seat stadium, it's going to be, you know, you lose the intimacy. My favorite story is at the reception afterwards, this German guy comes up to him, Mr. Smith, <laughs> Mr. Smith, I am a lawyer in, in Hamburg, and I want to tell you, you, you made me cry. <laughs> <laughs> but it's true. It was, a, it was it's astounding. So it's, it's big. Even though the established poetry people, some of them still don't want to admit what it is because they, they are jealous of the audiences we get. Well, you know, you bring up something uh, really interesting because you have traveled the world with the Poetry Slam. Just like, like just Billy, like the same Billy, situation. And just like Naomi as well. So I was going to throw that question out to Naomi. So you studied in London, mm -hmm. and um, you came from New York. And even though you're from Chicago, you were working in New York at the Studio Museum. And of course, now you're back here. And I'm wondering for Naomi and then, of course, all of you, how does Chicago compare to the other cultural meccas that um, you've? I mean Without a doubt, Chicago is a cultural mecca. Yes, I mean, yes, agreed, know, of course. I mean, me loving art comes from being right here in Chicago. Mm. And I think a lot of what we've already heard tonight is your two disciplines is about mm. making things live. Right. And making things real, right? You can read music, but what does it mean to learn how to perform it and live it? You can read poetry, but what does it mean to actually recite it and teach others and compete even? That's the beautiful thing about slam. You kind of like, you go right. off, right? Yes, you <laughs> really... If you're bad, you're... You can be told you're, going you're down. Bad. Yes, right. <laughs> exactly. yeah, people will take you down. But you can live art right here in Chicago. We have yes. amazing art institutions. And clearly, there is the Art Institute, right? The big sort of grand dame. But then there are beautiful, smaller institutions like the Museum of Contemporary Photography that has these beautiful jewel like shows. And of course, there's the institution that I grew up with, which is the MCA. Right. And I saw. Mark right, performed right, right. The when the MCA, the building that it's in currently, when it opened. There was oh, a 24-hour party. And the idea is not everyone's going to go into a museum and look at the pictures on the wall, right? Right. Some people want to feel welcome into the building. And the way they feel welcome is to provide something that feels alive mm -hmm. yeah. to people so that they now claim the building as their own and then begin to participate and somehow take in the visual art. And that really is the goal now. As well, and MCA has always been that that always been game that bringing people in there and uh, absolutely yeah. Their summer solstice when they started that thing we did, we uh, the slam was a showcase of it. Yeah, absolutely. yeah. The, the we MCA's got in trouble because they had so many people listening that. <laughs> We were breaking the fire code because there were so many people. <laughs> I bet you would break the fire code. I would. Yes. Yes. <laughs> but so this brings up a bigger question, you know, particularly for the visual arts. Mm -hmm. You know, everyone has music in their life, and they've heard some sort of poetry or self-expression. But you know, how do you get people interested in the visual arts? And so you have that challenge of reaching out to them, sometimes on difficult subjects. And so, mm -hmm. as a, a curator, I'm wondering how you do that. I don't think there's a how. I think you have to figure it out step by step. I mean, I'll be the first one to admit, I didn't know anything about art when I started studying it. Right. Which is why I started studying it, uh -huh. right? I thought it was important. So the step one is to make people realize that this is important to you. That somehow 
there have been a group of people that we call artists who put their soul out right. in their art. And these people aren't just geniuses and they aren't weirdos, mm -hmm. but they're part of our community. And they've made the fabric of our lives throughout the centuries. When you go into museums, what would be preserved? We preserved art. Right. Because it tells us about ourselves over the centuries. And then step two is to somehow present the work in a way that relates to the person. So you can't sometimes stand on a podium and say, this is important because X, Y, and Z. Mm -hmm. What you have to say is, what does it look like to you? What do you see in it? How does your body relate to it? How can you enter into the space of the artwork? Right. Not all artwork, even if it's sitting still, is static. Mm -hmm. Right. You know? Sometimes it vibrates. Sometimes yes. it asks you to walk through it. Sometimes it asks you to touch it. Not often. But, <laughs> not often. Right. But, but that's interesting what you said because, you know, I think a lot of people uh, are almost afraid of, yeah. of art, you know, because, you know, they feel like they don't understand it. Right. But the point you made about uh, what does it mean to you is exactly the technique that we use in blues in school because the blues being the most universal music is uh, my mentor who I played with for the better part of six years, Willie Dixon, defined the blues as the facts of life. Mm -hmm. So whatever you're going through, mm -hmm. you know, can be expressed, whether it be a, a, a flat tire or a broken marriage, I didn't do my homework, mm -hmm. you know, it's, it's all the blue. It's the, it's the most universal music that there is. That's right, yeah. and it's your story, but then you give it a form. So right. That's the blues, it's a form. Right. And our form is the exhibition, and our form is the performing arts. So the idea is that constantly the museum is making exhibitions, but also performing art shows that draw people in, and sometimes we cross them over. Yes, so there's new right. initiative now called Live Arts, where we're taking the theater out of the theater yeah. and moving it into the galleries. And we're taking the art out of the galleries and moving it into the theaters. It's a great show coming up. Probably someone across a lot of yours, Mark Bamuthi Joseph. An amazing poet. Yes, and with the Astor Gates. With the He's Astor Gates, who's a sculptor. And yes, they have collaborated yes. as performers and as sculptors, singers and dancers, to create an amazing show opening in mid April. And yeah, you know, when, this, when the slam started back in the, in the 80s, that, that the, all the galleries used to have performances all the time. The mm -hmm. Performance art was on, some of it was pretty bad, but uh, it, was, it was pretty exciting mm -hmm. that the, the crossover was. Was big. I'm glad to hear that it's because it died out for a while. It's, a little bit, yeah, right? There was a pickup in the '60s, right. '20s. It was huge. You know, uh -huh. you would have visual mm -hmm. art and theater together. '60s again, and then mm -hmm. a little bit in the '80s, and then yeah, everyone started specializing. But the idea is, what we call it at the museum is convergence. Mm -hmm. How do we converge these disciplines together and not just so talk smart. about what music is, what theater is, That's and what great. art is, but how do we bring it together and talk about what contemporary culture is, and right. how do we make the museum a place where contemporary culture lives? And what I <laughs> What I love about this is you're making it relevant for people. Absolutely. And mm -hmm. the reason I think that's so important and what you all do is because, as we all know, we're losing our arts fund funding mm -hmm. and that's dwindling away. And without art, you really don't have history. You don't have a sense of where you've been. And so I'm so glad to see we have institutions like mm -hmm. the MCA and what you're doing to make it relevant for people so that they want to get more art in their life. Mm -hmm. Because you only do what you know. So if you didn't grow up on art, you're not just going to suddenly say, like, I know, I'll run over to the MCA. And right. you won't do that. You know, you'll go to the sports game that you always go to, which is great, too. But you know, you only do what you know. And so this, I think, makes it really easy access. Absolutely. That's what the MCA does. If you don't like visual arts, you'll find that you do like it through theater or exactly. through music. Or, mm -hmm. But hold on, because I have a tweet for you. Uh, uh, so at, a challenge. <laughs> <laughs> at Cherry Devo, uh -huh. Cherry Diva, Cherry Devo, I heard her laugh, I think, so she's out there. You have won yourself two passes to the MCA. See me after the show. You get free <laughs> tickets to the MCA. Her question for you is, Miss Beckwith, the MCA often hosts music and performance art events. How do you dis how do you decide to bring these in? So basically, how do you decide which? How do you which program? Yes, how do you program? Well, I wish I were responsible for it all, but the great thing, first of all, is there's several levels of programming. It's not as if everything happens right in stage. So there is an amazing performing arts program in the theater and moving outside of it, curated by Peter Taub. Yes, what do you think of the audience? Peter. Is he? Peter? Peter? Here? I know Peter. Peter? Peter? Everybody all knows right, Peter. Well, I knew Peter <laughs> in New York. His reputation <laughs> precedes yes, him. Yes, right. And he's brought some of the most exciting local and international work right here to Chicago. 
because of that. But then there's also several other opportunities that happen outside of the building. Uh huh. Jazz on the Terrace. Right, oh, Tuesdays I love Jazz in the on summer. the Terrace, It's yes. incredible, right? Put together by Amy Coral. There's also all sorts of programs that happen on Fridays, or first Fridays. And so the idea is that sometimes you're not gonna come in and see something formal. Mm -hmm. You're not gonna just sit down in the theater and like watch right. something on a proscenium, but that you can really integrate your experience throughout yes. the building, walking through it, yeah. walking out on the terrace, listening even on the top floors of the galleries. And no, I was just going to say, and the idea, as you say, is to reach the broadest audience. Yes, yes, and that's what I love about what each of you do or what you partake in doing at the MCA mm -hmm. is you really make it out of the box. You bring it to people so they don't have to work to come to right. you. You go to them and really sort of open that up. So um, we have a really nice quote or uh, clip from the director, oh. the chief curator at the MCA, Michael Darling, who's just a wonderful person. So we have an MCA clip that we're going to show you. And he talks about how he really wants to open the museum up to um, people, to mm -hmm. let it be a, a place of questioning. So what is your top priority for people when they come to the museum? That they learn, that they feel, that they relax? What connection, at what level are you hoping to make for them? I'd say that maybe the primary idea is really to suggest that contemporary artists are dealing with the same everyday issues that all of us deal with. They're dealing with the politics, they're dealing with the economics, they're dealing with the social and cultural issues that all of us think about, struggle with, and then they're, they're just dealing with those things in, in visual terms. I think, you know, sometimes contemporary art gets a bad rap for trying to trick people, pull the wool over your eyes, do some kind of stunt, and when you really get to meet the artist behind it, you recognize how earnest this is that they're doing. They're not trying to trick people, they're trying to find a way through history to make it a little breakthrough of some kind. But one thing that I also think about the role that the museum has today, too, is it's a place where you are allowed to have questions and not and allowed to kind of not have all the answers and when you're walking down Michigan Avenue you understand the codes of commerce and you understand what people are wearing but when you come into a museum that we want to kind of give people the freedom to stand in front of something not know exactly what it is and then allow that self-reflection how important is it for you to connect to the general public as opposed to the art collecting public I mean, for me, it's really important because I don't want contemporary art to just be a niche activity. I mean, I think so much of this work speaks to all of us and to our general kind of cultural, social condition. To me, it just defeats the purpose to obscure it with all kinds of language that's difficult, maybe, or ideas that are too difficult. I mean, these things are complicated for sure, but I think there are some simple, clear ways to start to engage with them. Normal guy, isn't he just such like a normal guy? You think the chief Shouldn't curator? Shouldn't he be an artistic guy? Uh, he, should be, or, yeah. he should be German with black hair. Yes, you think he'd have a yeah. bit of a toot, or you know, he'd. But he's like such a nice, normal, approachable guy. And what he said in the beginning is, you know, sometimes art gets a bad rap, and people think that um, artists are these obscure um, individuals, but really they're just sort of telling their life stories, and they're trying to process the world as we know it, and they're going through the same things that, that we all are. And this is one thing that I love about the blues, because it just tells you how they're feeling, no holes barred. Um, and it's funny, because you came to the blues very late. Here's a little tidbit. So if you're ever in Trivial Pursuit, you can know this little fact of, mm -hmm. factoid about Billy Branch. You went to the University of Illinois, and you were a poli-sci major. So I mean, you didn't even get to the blues till much later. Well, uh, it, it, it was uh, concurrent with that. Uh, uh, I was born in Chicago, but raised up in Los Angeles. I returned to attend uh, UIC, and uh, with the possible intent of becoming a lawyer. <laughs> and uh, sorry, sorry. <laughs> Why are you laughing? <laughs> <laughs> and uh, I, you know, I did get uh, you know a BA in political science. But on, during all that time, uh, one of my best friends on campus was the stepson of the late great Junior Wells, who was one of Chicago's treasure, you know, one of the greatest blues harmonica players. So he would take me down to Teresa's Lounge, 48th in Indiana, oh, which was a uh, mecca for any of the uh, local Chicago blues men. And, I mean, and famous Muddy Waters and Holland Wolf and people passed through there. Mm -hmm. And, uh, but it, w it was not the traditional path of the guys that come from the Delta from the, you know, from the South. 
but it was, at that time, it was like a Disneyland or a cornucopia of wow. the blues because I swear, and, and this is part of my in inspiration or, uh, of teaching the blues to the children because there were these great, great musicians that were unsung and most of them died uh, in poverty and without a lot of notoriety except maybe in Europe. Mm -hmm. uh, ironically, but here, you know, they, the, the prophet hated in his own country, but I was able to learn from the best of the best at that time, and, and these guys were phenomenal. Yeah. Yeah. Well, that's why, how many people know about um, Chicago Blues, a living legend? Mm -hmm. Okay, okay, so, okay, more should know. Tell us about Chicago Blues, a living legend, because you are um, working with some of the, the greatest people today and traveling all throughout Europe, through France specifically, I think, right? Oh, wait, 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 what are you speaking of, Elizabeth? Uh, the, the Chicago Blues, a living legend, so, right? Are you talking about Buddy Guy's legends? No, no. Oh, you, no, oh, you don't know, no, you're talking about Chicago Blues, a living history. A living history, yeah. I'm sorry, okay. you're a living legend, you're a living history, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. Okay. I'm sorry. Buddy's not even here when he gets in the conversation. <laughs> Damn it. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Okay. I keep calling you a living legend. Okay, well, living I said, yes. wow, did I miss something? It's me. Too much it's wine. Cut me off like, already. Cut the me lost, off. The lost 12 years. <laughs> <laughs> no, no. It, uh, Chicago Blues, A Living History is a project uh, initiated by Larry Scholar, guitar player, producer. And what he did, he incorporated... Uh, Billy Boy Arnold, uh, blues harmonica great, learned from the great Sonny Boy Williamson, number one, John Lee Williamson, uh, John Primer, Lurie Bell, and myself with initial and a uh, uh, all-star Chicago uh, rhythm section. We recorded a CD, two album CD with special guests, and we've toured this through Europe from the major blues festivals. Been a huge success. The first CD was nominated for a Grammy. We are robbed by <laughs> we, we really would rob, really, by uh, Ramlin, I, I mean, nothing against him, but Ramlin Jack Elliott got us, who's an 80-year-old country folk singer, but does have some blues history. But, I mean, we were at the Grammys, and we're sitting there waiting, preparing our <laughs> acceptance speeches. You were and, and we're there, and, and they say, and the winner is oh. Ramlin Jack <laughs> And he gets up and says, I just got back from a cowboy convention. No. <laughs> and, but at any rate, <laughs> but the concept is the uh, uh, members of my generation, along with Billy Boy Arnold, to, who are um, adept at keeping the Chicago, the old, old classical yeah. uh, Chicago blues tradition from the 1950s, Muddy Waters, Holland Wolf, Sonny Boy Williamson, Chuck Berry, mm -hmm. Little Walter. Yeah. We're keeping that intact, and it's presenting that in a CD format and a tour. Yeah. The second CD is out, and the guests include uh, Buddy Guy, James Cotton, Magic Slim, Zora Young, Ronnie Baker Brooks. So mm -hmm. it's just about, you know, as much as uh, things evolve, there's so much uh, merit in, in, in keeping the tradition intact. In so we're back to this theme of preservation and preserving the sense of history, knowing where you've come from to be able to go forward and how important that is in what you do. And I'm amazed how interested, again, France is in this. Didn't I read somewhere that the mayor, there's right. a mayor in France who's really been championing this. Well, the, the, the project was financed by a small town in France, Amazing. a suburb of Paris called aulnay sous bois and the mayor and his contingency, they came to the Chicago Blues Festival for a couple of years, and he made a presentation. But uh, you'll, rem you'll remember uh, in the international news a few years, they had this big immigration um, uh, controversy in France. They were having these riots. Sure. And in all nay sous bois was a town where there was a mur I don't know the specifics, but there was, I think, uh, some youth some young people were murdered during those riots. So uh, with the advent of them getting a Grammy nomination, they, they, they just embraced it because what better way than to put a positive picture on this yeah. tragedy? So yeah. 
the whole town kind of uh, yeah. became in, enmeshed in this blues project. Yeah, so this is another reason that I'm always amazed when arts funding is the first to go. Because you can see this form of self-expression and history, and it's giving people a way out and a, a way to mend and a way to express themselves. And you think, God, if you take that away, Honestly, what's left? Mm -hmm. Really, honestly, what's left? I have a tweet for you, but I think I'm going to hold on to this tweet because all this talking about the blues, don't we want to hear some blues? Yeah. Don't we want to get to the real deal? Because God, turn. he is the yeah, real deal. Turn. It's so exciting. Sing for your supper. Do right. it, mister, do it. All right, okay. Give us some blues. All right, all right. Um, what I wanted to do if, uh, oh, you, yeah, there's a, there's a, are you looking Look, for that drink? I'm so he's for, been really excited. No, I'm not to... looking for the drink. I'm looking for those <laughs> harmonicas. Both. Uh, while, while we get the Billy, harmonica, Billy has been Billy. enamored with my drink called the Fear yeah. No Art Elizabethan. And so we can, we can bring yeah, that yeah. to you as well. Yeah. Maybe we'll get the harmonica You know, when you're instead. talking about the, the okay. preservation. Oh, there you go. He's what I ready. wanted, pardon? Go on. Oh, okay. We're filling time while you were getting Okay, I, I got about what, three minutes for you. Oh, no, okay. you take the stage I, I and just you wanna, do yeah. what you want. I want to. <laughs> thank you. No, I want, what I wanted to do was uh, share with you, you know, a little show and tell, because um, in this, uh, th this journey, uh, a lot of you may not be aware of how many different types of harmonicas there are. Okay, they come from, uh, how many people are familiar with harmonicats, for example? I am. Okay, there you go. <laughs> I used to listen okay. to the Okay, harmonica and sound orchestras that had anywhere from four, three, four, to 20 or more members, but these are different harmonicas, and this is one I thought I should, this is a tremolo chromatic harmonica, which has 128 reeds, which I don't normally play for blues, but I'll just let you, Okay, just uh, you know, just so you get. And then Incredible. this, uh, I was acquired. A, a, a woman in Seattle area saw me on television being interviewed about my blues in school. Oh. <laughs> now I have one at home that's about this long. I'm, I'm not kidding. I'm not exaggerating. Okay, <laughs> but this is a bass harmonica, and uh, I'm not so good at playing it, but but. <laughs> It's kind of tricky. This is a, I, I'm, I'm, I'm gonna do a shameless plug. I'm uh, endorsed by uh, Suzuki Manji mm -hmm. Harps now. And this is, they came out this, how many, if you're familiar with Sonny Boy Williamson, uh, Rice Miller, Sonny Boy number two, there were two, John Lee Williamson and, and Rice Miller. They, uh, but they both were popular in Chicago. But Sonny Boy was famous. He, he played, uh, usually the harp for the blues, Chicago blues, it was a Marine band by Honer. Okay, 10 hole harp, this is a 10 hole harp, but he would use a, a 14 hole harp, and, but it would get a sound like this. Anyway, something like that. You take all the time you want. I mean it, yeah. And you know, the beauty of this, and, and when I, I first started playing, I, I didn't know anything about blues. I was playing, I was, this is what I was actually playing at 11 years old.
But anyway, so, and, and that's all I knew how to play till I came to Chicago in the summer of 69. <laughs> Gypsy woman told my mother Before I was born You got a boy child coming Gonna be a son of a gun He gonna make pretty women Jump up and shout Then the world gonna know What's this all about Do you know I'm here Everybody knows I'm here Well, I'm the hoochie coochie man Everybody knows I'm here Now, this is the part when I came to Chicago. This is a true story. I'm going to leave you alone. I came to Chicago In the summer of 69 I didn't smoke no reefer. I didn't drink no wine. But when the summer was over, I was a changed man. Now I can turn up a bottle, and they call me Reefer Dan. But you know I'm here. Everybody knows I'm here. Okay, he is playing April 20th and April 21st at Roses, and then he's also playing April 28th and April 29th at the Old Town School of Folk okay. Music. He's going to be a headliner at Blues Fest, uh, and then he's also playing in July in France. And, and, and I'm playing tonight <laughs> at, and you're playing at, at Artists' Artists. Lounge, where at we've Artists. been 28 years every Monday. I thought I went to your birthday party at Artists' Lounge. Yes. I was there. That was a lot of fun. So. Maybe. Um, Mavis Staples showed up. I know it. Yeah, right. Believe me, Mavis Staples showed up for his birthday, and we had a great time at Artists. It was uh, really a thrill. So I do have a, um, a tweet for you. And this is from Peony Pow, at Peony Pow. Uh, how do you encourage students to open up to the creative process who present resistance to it? I'm, I'm sorry. Yes, no, I, it's, I, I, it's I yes. I have to come you down. Have to, you actually, it. okay, I'm going to let you come down. I'm going to let you come down and, and just to tell you like a tiny little, no, no, tell, tell you a tiny little tidbit. The other day someone invited me to a Black Sox game and we were like in the third row and I would never think to go to a sporting event and so I went with this person, graciously <laughs> asked me and we sat down and I looked at the ticket price. It was $175. Wow. Was a hunt. Now, I'm just telling you, how much did it set you back to come to the main stage and have food and listen to Billy Branch? That was really pretty fantastic. Pretty fantastic. Okay, so we have a, um, we have a tweet for you from Peony Pow. How do you, how do you encourage uh, your students to open up to the creative process when they're resistant to it? Well, uh, that's Oh, and that person has won a CD. They, they have won the... <laughs> CD, and you are lucky. You were very lucky, Peony Pow. Um, I just, uh, a few months ago, I completed a residency in Traverse City, Michigan. It was just a, a four-day residency. But in four days, the children, uh, this is an alternative high school, and the kids were on stage and at a 300-seat uh, auditorium. But uh, we had one, one of the students was a very serious young man. Uh, the the my coordinator said he never says anything to anybody. He was very active. He was vocal. He participated. Not only did he sing, he moved around. He was he was studying to be a he was a serious boxer. And um, the key is, I, I think, like with all of us that are working with the youth, is, is to relate. Is to you know what gives you the blues. You know, make it personal. And 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 I make it fun yeah. and uh, I'm not 
I mean, I'm, you make it serious, but you let them know that they can have fun, and it doesn't matter where you come from, uh, what your background is, what your ethnicity is. You know, we all have the blues, and when they grasp that you can, I mean, that's the beauty of the blues, is that you go on stage, and the guy on the mic is singing about your old man. You know, I mean, singing about whatever you're going through. Mm. That's the beauty of it, mm -hmm. that we can all, it is Always. actually the most universe. So that the key the, the, is just showing them that they. It's that, human. That, that, that they had the blues too. Yes, yeah. yeah. Well, I always find um, that people tend towards the art form that brings them back to themselves. Mm -hmm. And so when exposed to the right art that they connect with, it's actually something that connects them back to themselves. And, and that's why they stay with it. But see, I'm interested in that I find very little resistance, and I'm wondering if these mm. gentlemen also find resistance. I mean, one of the, my favorite thing to do is really talk to high schoolers. Oh, yeah. Mm -hmm. High school students tend, tend to be the most open. They're at that age where they got uh -huh. just a little bit of education. They got a lot of opinions. Right. But they're still very open-minded, mm. and I think uh -huh. that's really incredible because I've never seen them close down yeah, to even most, the most difficult art. And we've got this incredible program this year with high school students at the museum that they have been there for an entire year and those kids show up every week and they are curating and they are writing. Yeah. I mean, it's the creative agency and now they're running, they're running tours. I mean, they are really wow. dedicated to this. Mm. Wow. Yeah, and that, that to me, that sort of engagement mm -hmm. brings people to school because without that sort of interactive, creative, fun, mm -hmm. you're just sort of talking at people and you can see that they won't mm -hmm. stick with school. You know, if you right. don't bring in these elements that are, mm -hmm. are interesting. But you wanted to say something about no, oh, it's, 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 they're resistant. I think maybe you're talking about there are some formal, traditional ways of te teaching things that put up a wall between, mm -hmm. right. between a kid and mm -hmm. it, makes, it, it makes them think that, oh, they, that's just done by these great people. They, they mm -hmm. can't be creative or mm -hmm. they don't have a chance to do that. Right. And I think you know, what you've talked about, what Billy's talked about, mm -hmm. and what we do in the slam world is, hey, you know, forget about how the traditional way Let's go, you know, mm -hmm. and, uh, yeah. and just, treating everybody yeah. the same through treating everybody just say, you know, you, I may be an old guy, but, and you're a young kid, but, you know, we're on the same level. Mm -hmm. and, and, and it works for the slam, and sounds like the same kind of thing. Well, also, you have a personal history a little bit. I mean, didn't. No, didn't... I was a dummy kid. I was a dumb kid in the Chicago public school system. And poetry <laughs> kind of saved you, right? Poetry. Saved Mrs. maybe Mrs. Panis, strong. the mean uh, assistant principal <laughs> at Caldwell School, forced me to read John Steinbeck's The Pearl. I don't know mm. why she picks that book, but, uh, and I never really read a book through. I just faked it for years. <laughs> and the motif, if you're familiar with the, the, the book, it's, the, the motif is everything is a song. The song of the table, mm -hmm. the song of the wine, the song of the family, which really touched me. Every, the key, 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 I can't even remember the, the, the main character's name, but he turned everything into a song. Ah, it, was, nice. it was beautiful. And for a guy from the southeast side by the mills, you know, to express or not acknowledge beauty and sensitivity, you weren't supposed to do that. And here I found a world where they did that. Mm -hmm. And yeah, it, it, it opened a big door, a big door. So again, I And I think that that's probably what you do for the mm -hmm. kids, you know. Open it's, a door. It's a, it's a doorway, especially right. the bad kids. Right, mm -hmm. right. The troublemakers right. are the smartest and most creative. Exactly. Absolutely. Uh, Absolutely. One of my residencies in, 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 Let's in hear Milwaukee. Let's the troublemakers. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Over there, I can see them. Yeah, we got him. One of my residencies, a month-long residency, it wasn't until the final day that they, uh, the coordinator, coordinator said, uh, you know, you had the two worst kids in the school. Mm. Well, these two kids were the only ones that had perfect attendance, but mm. they pointed that one. He said, well, he burned down the principal's office. <laughs> well, the other one threatened to kill his mother. But they were my model students from day one. Yeah, yeah. looking for an outlet, right? Yeah. Looking right. for a way, yeah. I've had experiences like that, too. I, I taught in an alternative school in the middle of Texas. And in Texas, 
Bush territory. <laughs> what they do, they take all the bad kids and they put them all in one school, Absolutely. you know? And it's like lockdown. Mm -hmm. And they walked into the, they walked, I'm there and the people that hired me got a video camera going. And they, we go into the, the lunchroom, they got the security guys walking with us. And I'm thinking, what are we doing? And these kids walked in. One guy looks like a killer, the other one's a pimp, you know, and I think, oh man, what's gonna happen? And I got the video going. I'm, Mark's gonna fail with the video. By the time this was over, they were so smart, they mm -hmm. were so creative. We were all crying at the end of it because it was such a moving experience. They're, they're gonna have a, a club after this and everything. The sad thing is, about, I don't know if you experience this or not. Mm -hmm. The sad thing is you do this, you have that great day. Connection. Those kids go right back right, to, to where the they same, came same. from. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, and mm -hmm. it, it's, there's nothing to keep it going. Mm -hmm. you know? yeah. It's, mm -hmm. it's kind of sad, but for that, for mm -hmm. that moment. Mm -hmm. And you hope that you reach these someone. Kids, why are these kids treated, you know, mm -hmm. you know, locked up in this thing like this? Because, mm -hmm. you know, give a better chance than, mm -hmm. uh, than they do, so I don't. Mm -hmm. I, Got on the soapbox there for a moment. So, well, we're back to, you know, without arts funding, you know, you're, you're losing this chance you know, to reach people, I, I think. Arts funding, that's important. But, you know, it's a mentality, you know. Mm -hmm. It's a mentality in this country that has to change mm -hmm. around. Yeah, you know, especially, you know, I love Chicago. I grew up here, you know. Mm -hmm. and, and, and it's a great city for people starting out, mm -hmm. you know. It is, It's yeah. a great it's an open, open city. city. Mm -hmm. But, you know, the... Some of the people up there at the upper levels, they don't, they don't take care mm -hmm. of the people that start out in this, in this mm -hmm. town and right do on. something, you know? And, 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 and they don't take, they don't, you know, they could take better care of, of uh, yeah, I got all these kids from the young, young louder than the bomb thing that's yes, happening. Yes, yeah, yeah, sure. You know, who's gonna boost, take them up to the next Let level? They have a great moment in high school. Where are they going to go after that? You know, mm -hmm. it's a, it's not just the funding. It's it's in all of us. It's a mentality mm -hmm. that that art is art is sacred. It's it's much more important than Walmart mm -hmm. or McDonald's. <laughs> you know, it is. I mean, I, 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 it's how we relate. Really, it's how I feel. It's how we relate, and it's what connects us back to ourselves. Um, probably Mark, everybody's probably shut off the video. Yeah, Mark could go on for a while. And luckily for Mark, we're going to open this up to an audience Q&A. So this is kind of new for us. Um, but before we do that and we kind of open up so that you guys can, just in case your tweets didn't get through or you didn't get picked, uh, we're going to let you guys talk to the artists. But first, let's hear from Matt and see what's going on in our kitchen because we all have more food. Everyone in the audience, too. We all have more food coming our way. Great. Let's hear from uh, Matt in the kitchen. All right, so the next thing I have for you guys is uh, ribolita. Um, it really is a Tuscan stew. Uh, it's similar to like a minestrone soup, uh, except it's just a little bit thicker and doesn't, doesn't have pasta in it. Um, and that thickness comes from bread. Uh, ribolita means reboiled, so the idea is that they would take a stew and they would take some bread and add bread to it, let it sit overnight, and then the next day reboil the soup, and then the bread would thicken the soup so you'd have more of a a stew or porridge than a brothy soup. So the first thing we're going to do is we're going to chop up a, a few vegetables that go in there. Uh, we have onions, uh, celery, carrot, leeks, and cabbage. So we try and get a nice, a similar size cut on all the vegetables so they cook at about the same pace. And then for the leeks, we're actually going to do rings. And as far as the cabbage goes, I just cut it randomly. There's no specific right or wrong way to do it. So this is our house smoked bacon. Um, pretty much all of the protein that we get, be it cow, pig, chicken, duck, rabbit, uh, we get from Slego Family Farms. And uh, we get it because it's, it's great. It's amazing quality. And um, so we get pork bellies from them. And then we take those pork bellies and we do a brown sugar cure on them. We let that cure for about five days, uh, or until it's firmed up and ready. Then we smoke them ourselves, so it's nice hickory smoked bacon. 
And we have our finished ribollita right here. Um, you can tell it's thickened up a little bit due to the bread, and you can see all the ingredients in there. And so we're just going to get it into our big bowl and plate it up. And then we get our nice little piece of grilled bread. We're just going to snuggle that in there. And then we have our milk braised pork that we've, we've grilled off. And now we are going to just finish it up with a little bit of a scallion, parsley, and garlic pesto. Uh, it's like a similar to a pesto, only without the cheese and nuts. Um, so just take a little bit of this on there. It's just a nice little bit of freshness to a dish that's been cooked a long time. So, And then just a little bit of Parmesan peeled right out over top. And there you have. And there you have a nice rulita dish. Ta -da. Get that out of the way. Well, thank you very much. I've had a great time tonight cooking for you guys. Uh, I hope to see you down at 1321 West Taylor Street at Three Aces. Come on down and enjoy some food and drink. Everyone is going to get some of this as well. You can see how good and hearty this food is. Amazing. Oh, great. And Matt's going to join us now that his hard work is through. Yay, Yay Matt, come on. Come on and join us. So I think what we're going to do right now, because um, we, we've gone a tad bit over it, and so I want to be respectful of all those people watching on fearnoart.tv. Maybe this is a good time that um, we let the audience go at the buffet and take a break and get some food. Come back and join mm. us, and we're going to do a Q&A. For everybody who's been watching on fearnoart.tv, thank you so much. We are last Monday of every month. So next April 30th, that will be the last Monday in April, we have Nora Dunn from Saturday Night Live, restaurateur Paul Kahn, who doesn't know him, just recently named one of Chicago's 100 uh, most powerful people. He's going to be debuting Public and Quality Meats here, which is fantastic. We have uh, Peach Carr from Project Runway, and we have Lane Alexander from Chicago Human Rhythm Project. So you absolutely want to be here April 30th, either watching on fearnoir.tv or in the audience. Uh, we're going to let everyone kind of get up and drift towards the buffet. Get your rubelita. Come on back, and we're going to do a Q&A. Yes, rubelita. OK, so uh, let's roll the sponsor ads, and we'll come right back for a Q&A. Go ahead and eat, everybody, and we'll get, right. we'll get Matt some good questions. Are you OK? Yeah, I'm good. This is fantastic. Thank you. Le Cordon Bleu College of Culinary Arts is dedicated to preparing aspiring professionals in the areas of culinary arts, patisserie and baking, and hospitality and restaurant management. Disaster Planning and Response Art Rescue is a first responder for the world of art, providing planning, packing, evacuation, conservation, and storage for all your treasured possessions. Paperweights are the crown jewels of glass artistry. You can discover both antique and modern paperweights at the L.H. Selman Gallery in Chicago's Fine Arts Building. <laughs> 